Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. And we have come to the last message in our studies from the book of Song of Solomon. I pray that this series has been a blessing to you and it's our intention that we get to go back to the Word of God and to apply and to talk about the most important areas of our lives, our earthly life, and that is uh, marriage, courtship. And, and I pray that God has given you wisdom and some very practical tips to apply this because it is God's counsel, His advice, His word to you and I. And I know that He will bless it when you do it because it is God's word. And there is authority and there is an anointing right there because God has spoken. And we're doing it because it is His word, the scripture. So in this last message, we come to poem number seven. There are seven poems altogether in eight chapters. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in chapter uh, in, chap in chapter 4 and 5, there was a wedding, uh, Solomon and the Shulamite women, and that is poem um, number 4. And 5 and 6, last week, uh, we talked about the conflict, the trouble that they had, and then a peaceful reunion, a happy reunion that they experienced, and uh, the rediscovering of the love that they had, the first love uh, uh, in springtime. All right, right after the conflict or the winter, uh, as they put it. Now, so, you know, there's an excitement and some, in, in some sense, an excellence with new relationships where the chemistry is strong, emotionally charged and high. But I want to say this, that, but there's nothing compared to the fulfillment and the contentment and the stability that comes with being with your spouse over a long period of time. Uh, the reward is so much more and better. There's an enriching experience when a couple not only grow old together, but they grow strong together. They are not just surviving in their marriage, but they are excelling in their marriage. When both let the other person grow individually and spiritually, then, of course, as well as in intimacy, the stability and the maturity together. So today we have come to this uh, message, this text that, that emphasize, which oftentimes the world would not talk about, uh, 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 faithfulness, growing all together, growing strong together, growing up together. And, 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 and not many experience this, by the way, as you know, not many would even experience a, a, a marriage like this. Few, uh, you know, and I would say those who are experiencing it, you are blessed because it is rare. So this con concluding poem, uh, um, which looks back on the relationship and now also looking forward. Look at verse five of chapter eight. Who is that coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? Under the apple tree, I awaken you. It's the word awaken appears quite a few times here, meaning uh, empowering, energizing, all right? Uh, there your mother was in labor with you. There she who bore you was in labor. So the opening here is similar to the opening of poem four. It's concerning the arrival of Solomon at the wedding, okay? That is uh, in Song of Songs, uh, chapter three, verse six, when he says, who is that coming up from the wilderness? Uh, he was marching out towards her on the wedding day, okay? But here in chapter eight, verse five, the question is now, who is that coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? Okay, now it is the Shulamite now, who is coming out. It's a reversing of role that we talked about last week as well. So uh, this time is after the wedding. The last time was before the wedding. She is the one taking the initiative to keep the marriage now. The wilderness obviously speaks of or points to uh, Israel's 40 years of tests in the wilderness before they entered the promised land. So in their love, this couple had overcome their wilderness experience, the trials, the tests, that temptation which threatened their marriage, their relationship. So they were in the wilderness of insecurity, 
They were in the wilderness of insensitivity. They were in the wilderness of isolation and indifference. But now they're about to inherit the promised land of renewed marriage. And my friends, uh, all of us who are married, you know, you came out from the wilderness of your marriage last week. And now we are getting into, marching into, walking into our promised land, the promised land, the Canaan land of your marriage. So this emergence from the wilderness is not merely through the institution of marriage, which is a public event, which is a formal event, the wedding day. But now it is through the covenant of marriage, which is a private leaning on each other to God. It's not an event. It is a lifestyle. It is a relationship. It is not public. It is what happens at home 24-7, every day, that only two of you and God watching and witnessing how you relate to one another. And they remain married, not because they have to, but because they choose to, because they want to. Look at verse 5, the second half. It's a key word there, the apple tree. Under the apple tree, I awaken you. There your mother was in labor with you, there she who bore you was in labor. You know, directing our attention toward the apple tree indicate a return to their first love. That was first mentioned, the apple tree, in chapter 2. Let me read that verse, verse 3, chapter 2. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight, I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. So putting all of this together, it would seem that she is telling him that she awakened him sexually, physically, and that he was now born anew. Instead of from his mother's womb, now is from her womb, emotionally, okay, sexually. The idea possibly being that she herself has followed the pattern of his mother in giving new life, a new birth to him as they revived their marriage after going through that period of wilderness, of distress. Now, by the way, apple trees were not native to that part of the world at that time. And it had to, had to be imported and cultivated to find a cultivated apple tree growing in the forest among other wild trees would be quite unusual. And the apple tree would stand out and be a delightful surprise. Like a cultivated apple tree, Solomon is unique in the eyes of, this, of the Shulamite women and stood out among all other men. Now, at that time, in the ancient Near Eastern, the apple tree was a common symbol for romantic love and sexual fertility. Now, because of its beauty, fragrance, its fruits, its fruitfulness. So here, in the same way that love is being described in that manner, the Shulamite had given her husband a type of new birth by awakening him to love. Now, this may refer to their first meeting. He may have found her sleeping under an apple tree. But here in this passage now, it is him who is sleeping and now being uh, reborn or had a rebirth experience, having a new purpose in life, being awakened to something bigger and something greater in life, from a single man now to become a married man. You know, guys, I think in many ways it speaks to us. You know, before we were married, we were a boy, right? Isn't it? They call us. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're not considered a man until you're married, they say. So the moment you're married, you, you're an adult. You, you have responsibility uh, and, and, and respect as well, given a lot more respect because you're married. Never mind how old you are when you got married, but the moment you're married, that respect is there. Uh, there's a sense of responsibility in life, and, and that is beautiful. And this is what is happening here. So having tied the whole book together, in the description of the renewal of relationship, the passage that follows forms a secondary high note. Here, you know, the high note was the wedding passage, okay, that eventually, chapter 5, verse 1. But now here, the high note is on that love being described for the very first time in this book, 
if you did not notice, all right? In the context where the appreciation and the revelation of your love, you know, comes much after the wedding and definitely after the wilderness experience. Now, let me pause here for a moment. What I'm saying is this, that the description of that love, the revelation of the love should have happened at the wedding day or the first time when they met, the courtship or the engagement, but it was not put there. That, that revelation of what love is, the description of that love is now finally placed at the end of this book. Meaning, after the wedding, after the wilderness, now the love is being refined and purified, tested. And now they're ready. In fact, she is the one who described what this love is like, finally to us. And the first thing that I noticed that, you know, is that she's saying that love is a valuable possession. It's the most valuable thing that you can ever have. That is in verse 6. It says, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. You see, the seal was the emblem of authority, worn on the right arm or against the heart by a string. It was a jewel from which one did not separate himself ever. It's always there. So Solomon is to place his wife as a seal over his heart and also upon his arm. This would be a stamp or a sign of possession and ownership. Once this stamp had been applied, it, 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 it leaves there permanently, a permanent mark that cannot be removed. So, you know, your spouse is permanently yours, belongs to you and the most valuable possessions that you have. Okay. Um, the second thing in verse 6 and 7, I noticed that love is a powerful possession. Not just valuable, but powerful. It says, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire. The very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods uh, drown it. Now, she asked to be his most valuable possession and wanted him to be the jealous lover. Jealous over her in the proper sense, in the positive sense. You see, there are only two relationships described in the scripture where jealousy is permitted and is potentially appropriate. And that is a divine human relationship. God is a jealous God. And then the marriage between the men and the women. Okay, so these are the only two relationships that must be and should be considered exclusive and must be guarded, protected. Okay? And, and, and then she next described the love they shed. It is as powerful as death, as controlling as the grave, as passionate as fire, and as irresistible as a river. Now, you know, the mention of the flame of the Lord is very interesting. You know, most people say the book of Song of Solomon has no mention of God. It is correct. But possibly there is a slight indirect mention of God. And that is right here in this verse that we're looking at, the flame of the Lord. So meaning here, such love that we just talked about, the, the, the love as a powerful possession, as the most valuable possession, this love, it is not a love that you can find from this earth, from this world. It's a love that only comes from God. Such love comes from God. And therefore, he uses the word, the flame of the Lord. Love of the right kind is not a flame kindled by man, but by God. Man's love will fail. It cannot be sustained. Man's love, the world's love is selfish. But God's love is giving. God's love is pure. God's love is sustainable. And this is the only place in the book where God is mentioned and should be mentioned. What I want to hear to say is this, as much as we work on the marriage for both singles and those married people, uh, you know, God must be in the picture. It's so easy. Sometimes we fall into the trap of wanting to have a strong marriage minus God. It's not possible. Yes, God must be in the picture because it is in the posture of restedness, God is working for us on behalf of us to build that marriage. He is the source of this love. When you run out of love, 
You cannot manufacture that love. You cannot manipulate that love. You just have to surrender yourself. God, give me that new love. Give me a baptism of love in this marriage. Fill my heart with your love because my love dries up. My love fails me. All right? So I want us to know that when God's love comes in and breaks into our hearts, no amount of adverse circumstances can extinguish this kind of love for the flame of God is inextinguishable. God's love is powerful. He never fails. And we see that in the person of Jesus Christ himself. God never fails. God's love in your heart will not fail you, will not fail your children, will not fail your spouse. And finally, love is a priceless possession, not only valuable, not only powerful, but priceless. What do we mean? Verse 7, chapter 8, if a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. The NIV Bible used the word scorn. Love is priceless. If a man gave everything he had for love, he would be utterly scorned, the scripture tells us. No one can purchase love. It is priceless. It is only available as a gift. It has nothing to do with earthly wealth. Earthly wealth is a blessing. It's a bonus. But it cannot increase or decrease the measure of your love. That love is from God. It cannot be bought. It is not an object. It is a chemistry. It's a gift. Either you have it or you don't have it. It's as simple as that. And you can have it when God dropped it and filled it into your heart. I want to close with this beautiful uh, two verses in closing. Look at verse 11 here. Verse 11 and verse 12. So Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon. He let out the vineyard to keepers. There's a key word, keepers. There were vineyard and keepers. Each one was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, my very own, is before me. Uh, literally in Hebrew, uh, at, the dispos- at, at my disposable, at, at my disposal, okay? At my disposal. You, O Solomon, may have the thousand and the keepers of the fruit two hundred. Now, let, let me ex- explain and expand these thoughts a little bit. These two verses clearly go together. Each mentioning Solomon, the vineyard, thousand, fruit, and keepers. Keyword, keepers. Now, how, how, how are we to take these verses together? Literally, figuratively, and, and why are they here in the first place? Now, number one, we must notice and realize that, uh, that the beginning of the book of Song of Solomon, uh, chapter one, okay, uh, the mention of the same of this vineyard and the keeper of the vineyard, okay, chapter one, verse six, all right, uh, concerning how the Shulamite woman, she was sent to the vineyard by her angry brothers, uh, and as a result, her skin was dark, right? And while she neglected her own vineyard, all right? That is chapter 1, verse 6. Now, here, as we come to a close, it wrapped up what they started, this whole book. This is a good ending. It's a beautiful ending. It's a happy ending right here. So Solomon had the vineyard in Baal Hamon, and the, the term vineyard here is used literally right here at this point in time, okay? And... in in reference to Solomon's physical vineyard, okay? But here, in the next verse, in verse 12, uh, uh, the vineyard is figurative. In in, in mentioning of the Shulamite vineyard, it is herself, her body, herself as a person, all right? So here, uh, uh, Solomon is making a contrast, okay, in this book. Uh, uh, Solomon own vineyard uh, produce crops, fruits that is sold to others. But the vineyard, which is figurative, the Shulamite woman herself, it cannot be sold. It cannot be bought. All right? This vineyard can only be given away with her permission at her disposal. Right? That's the verse that we read a while ago. So 
Here, she is saying that love is so powerful, it is the most valuable possession, the most powerful possession, but also the priceless possession that love can only be given away. It's a gift, it cannot be purchased. Okay? And now she is giving of her giving of herself to her husband Solomon freely. She chooses to love him. And in a marriage, this is what it should be like that love is willingly, freely given to another. It has nothing to do with material things. The quality, the measurement of that love is never, ever measured by material things, but it is the heart, the selflessness of that each other, giving of yourself to the other. And therefore, the word keeper is a key word here as we come to a close. It began with the Shulamite woman, chapter 1, verse 6, keeping the vineyard while neglecting uh, herself. Let me read that verse, chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. It says, My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. So the first vineyard is physical, literal. The second vineyard is figurative, herself, her body, right? So now it closes now with the keeping of the vineyard, physical, Solomon's vineyard, okay, that produces fruits, and the fruits was, was sold, okay, for some money. But then the second mention of vineyard is herself, which is figurative, and now she's the keeper of her vineyard and she willingly give of herself to him. What does it mean past that? In the marriage covenant, the important that we should keep the marriage covenant in the same way we keep the vineyards, okay? You keep the marriage covenant by giving of yourself, your vineyard to your spouse. The marriage can only be kept when you give of yourself, your vineyard to one another. The selflessness in this relationship. So they are keepers and they kept the covenant and they kept choosing each other. I want to close with some practical thoughts here. Having a healthy and a marriage and a happy marriage takes hard work, all right? Let me give you some practical things. Takeaway number one, husband and wife always choose to submit to the Word of God, Scripture, to keep the marriage happy and and healthy, it's not about techniques. It's not about human voices and human wisdom. It is God's voice and God's word, His wisdom. Submit to the authority of God's word. Let the scripture be the final authority in your marriage. Number two, trust, have faith in God and trust in one another. Number three, stay healthy. Keep yourself emotionally and spiritually healthy. And one other thing, to be healthy, to stay healthy, is to always choose to forgive. Forgiving person, all right? Number four, work on chemistry, romance. Maximize passions, romance, and affection. Always be sensitive to each other's needs. Number five, watch your temper. Always learn to listen before you speak. Anger is the biggest enemy to good communication. We learned that. Number six, be in a support group. Don't be alone. You will fall when you're alone. We need each other. Recognize the, important, the importance of a spiritual community. Here in the church, we have marriage ministry. We have kingdom groups where couples come together and walk together. And finally, pursue spirituality. You see, partners in great marriages find significance in their spiritual lives. Don't forget the spiritual dimension of your relationship. Don't, don't just look at the emotional dimension or the physical dimension, but the spiritual dimension is the most important that determines the emotional health of your relationship. Seek to grow in your walk with Jesus separately and together. Let me pray and bless you. Father, I just pray for every couple, everyone that is listening to this message. I pray that your word will come alive. The needs are everywhere out there 
and each one are different. Would you meet different needs in every one of them in Jesus' name? I pray for a miracle to happen right here and right now because your word is anointed. Your word has power. So quicken that word and begin to speak to the heart and the mind. Begin to bring transformation. Do the work that we cannot do. We surrender to you. With you, all things are possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.